Good afternoon. Everything, or almost everything around you, in this venue, in your home, in your car, uh, in your garage, in your wardrobe, or in your fridge, has traveled along the millions of miles of network that make up the global supply chain. A supply chain that links millions of companies and entrepreneurs with billions of consumers and partners. The scale of this supply chain is truly mind-blowing. Every year at Maersk, we move more than 325 million tons of food, finished goods, and raw materials across oceans, across continents, and in the air in a never-ending choreography. Most of the time, we don't think about this infrastructure. That's actually part of why I chose to join AP Muller Maersk 25 years ago, a significant infrastructure that underpins global commerce underpins our way of life, that is both so robust and so fragile, so complex and so simple. We take it for granted when we step into a supermarket, when we look around our house, we expect it to work, except when it doesn't. Because sometimes something goes wrong, and when this world makes the news, it is usually that something has gone wrong. It can be this, a sudden change in consuming pattern at the onset of a pandemic. Or this, a ship, a fluke accident that clogs the main artery of global commerce. And more recently, this, the fear that the current disruption is going to impact the year-end holiday shopping season. Lately, this invisible infrastructure has become more visible. It has shown to be too inflexible, too manual. It lacks the agility to cope with the changing world. The press, the media, likes to talk about each of these events in a discrete manner. They talk about the pandemic. They talk about infrastructure problem, the vulnerability of the Suez Canal, or the lack of truck drivers in the UK. But if you look at it with a bit more distance, if you really dig and look at the thread that is linking these discrete events, look even at those that happened before the onset of the pandemic, you see that there is something that is actually li linking them. It is the lack of application of technology across the supply chain. The lack of ability to leverage technologies that have proven themselves in other industry as being able to prevent, to mitigate, or to manage disruptions as they occur. The pandemic has not created a new set of circumstances. It has not created a new world. It has only accelerated trends that were there before and magnified weaknesses that we knew were there before. It has created a burning platform for us to really act and change and address these structural weaknesses that we see around the supply chain. When COVID hit, everything changed. Borders were shut, planes were grounded, high streets were closed, and supermarket shelves emptied. But quickly, after the initial shock and disruption, a real strong demand from the good economy took place and surprised everybody, as it became clear that the experienced economy was going to stay shut for a longer time. Companies that had slowed or stopped production suddenly had to ramp up to meet demand. They really had to accelerate production, and it's this acceleration that is still percolating through the supply chain today. Think about the explosion of e-commerce. This started a long time before the pandemic, but it accelerated to such a degree that companies can no longer consider e-commerce as being a side business from their traditional brick-and-mortar distribution. They're coming out of the pandemic having to absolutely rethink their network and have e-commerce at the center of what they do. This demands more than just figuring out last mile and return logistics. This is a fundamental redraw of your entire supply chain from where you source to how you procure, 
to how, what lead time you can live with and how you distribute your goods. Trends like this, or like the electrification automotive, were there before. What this, what the COVID has done, is really to accelerate and make the need for change now very, very clear. And yet, change is hard. Why is it that we have such a hard time of changing in this parameter? Take, for example, a car industry. Every year, we make 80 million different cars. Each of them is made of approximately 30,000 different pieces. For each of these pieces, you had to either mine or manufacture the raw material, transport it to a factory where it would be made into the screw or the windshield of the end product, shipped to an assembly plant where your car would come together, and then shipped again to the dealership where you will purchase it. Actually, by the time you sit behind the wheel of your car for the first time, it has traveled more miles than you will ever drive it. To orchestrate this supply chain, you need to coordinate thousands of different stakeholders, from vendors to service providers, technology providers, systems, platform, government bodies, regulatory authorities. You have to know the vertical, the strategy, the trends, the consumer demands. More than that, you have to know the idiosyncrasy of every car manufacturing company. Because it is the truth that every single car manufacturer, from Fiat to Ford to Ferrari, has found their own bespoke mode of structuring their supply chain, their own way of supporting their operation. This approach to bespoke has an incredible inertia. It is hard to change. It is also economically not very efficient and very, very difficult to move. The reason why the industry in logistics has a hard time changing is that it is in a bad need of a cloud moment. A moment where companies move away, realize that they need to move away from bespoke on-premise data centers to remote standard cloud computing in order to multiply the capabilities that they have. For that cloud moment to happen, you need service provider to deliver the offering that can deliver significantly better outcome than what the bespoke approach has been able to yield so far. And this is what we're setting out to do. This is why we have put technology at the center of everything that we do. This is why we've become a data-hungry, tech-driven company. Now, Maersk, as a company, is 117 years old. We were certainly not born a tech company, but we're becoming it rapidly. We need to, because thousands of companies, big and small, all around the world, depend on us transforming to support their ambition and their growth for the future. The change is not happening overnight, but it is happening fast. And now, propelled by the pandemic, we're seeing the relationship change fundamentally with our customers, moving beyond the cost optimization of each of the node of the supply chain and aligning around the delivery of flows, the delivery of outcomes that are meaningful for their business. Rapidly, the change is moving around three axes. The supply chain is digitizing, it is integrating, and it is decarbonizing. It is digitizing because aside from moving goods, the data is also, the supply chain is also moving an incredible amount of data, of information, which often, unfortunately, are still leaving an enormous paper trail. Depending on where you ship from and where you ship to, paper can, be the, can amount to up to 20% of the cost of your shipment. It can include up to 100 different stakeholders that have to touch or provide pieces of information in order for a container to move seamlessly. Creating a platform that can connect the entire ecosystem and allow it to exchange information, documents, and data freely and seamlessly 
is a way to not only reduce cost, but is a way also to increase the lead times, to decrease the lead times that you have in your supply chain. With TradeLens, a blockchain-enabled platform that we have founded with other members of the ecosystem, we have created a piece of infrastructure that can help link all the players and stakeholders in the ecosystem and deliver a radically better outcome for their documentation and their information flow. The developments that we have put in place in MERS.com have made it one of the biggest B2B platform in the world. Last year alone, we had more than 3 billion discrete business events, from pricing search, to booking, to tracking. An industry that has for a long time relied on old EDI technology is also rapidly, finally, moving to an API setup. The integration that is happening as we move towards API creates a better shared context between customers and service provider and aligns incentives to really deliver on supply chain outcomes rather than focus on SLAs and uh, node optimization. Aside from these transactions, the onset of application of AI ML onto demand planning, demand sensing, operation planning, and network design are huge areas of opportunities where technology will play an ever-growing role and where the capabilities of the supply chain will be greatly enhanced. The supply chain is integrating as well. Integrating because this optimization on a node-by-node -node basis has meant that where the nodes connect have become the single weakest point in the supply chain. Every handover, like in a relay race, is an opportunity for mistake, for delays, or for failure. The rapid integration from products into solutions, door-to-door -door or fulfillment-to-door in the physical movement of goods, and the integration of these solutions with the data flow that I just mentioned, is creating a powerful new combination, a powerful new way of managing the supply chain. A good example is actually how we have managed IoT devices in our reefer containers. We move every year half a million of containers of fruit and vegetables around the world. By activating tracking IoT technology across the entire cold chain, we've been able to provide instant visibility, transparency, proactive notification to our customers. They can remotely set the temperature of their containers, start the ripening of bananas before they even touch land, and make sure that they are perfectly ripe as they land in your fruit bowl in the morning. This ability to integrate and leverage data to provide better supply chain outcome is phenomenal and rapidly changing what companies expect from their supply chain. It's moving it from an art of problem solving into a science of business opportunities. But that would not be enough if we didn't address one of the major problems of the global supply chain, namely its carbon impact. Over the last decade, we have, with the help of data scientists, been able to completely re redefine our understanding of carbon emission around the supply chain. In a decade, we've been able to reduce through IoT, data analysis, and, uh, uh, and uh, other studies, we've been able to reduce our carbon emission by 40%. But that is not enough. We've also developed dashboards and created visibility for our customers to assess the consequences of some of their supply chain decisions from a carbon perspective and not only from a cost perspective. The next challenge, though, is to move from incremental improvement to a radically different supply chain. It means putting trucks, ships, and eventually airplanes into moving from being carbon burners into being carbon neutral. We have invested in startups that have developed fully electric and autonomous trucks. We are starting pilots on electric trucks in California and will expand those pilots in Europe in the months to come. We expect this to generalize very rapidly. But the real challenge is to move 400-meter container ships to be carbon neutral. 
In 2018, as a company, we made a commitment that we would be carbon neutral by 2050. When we made that commitment, it was very much a moonshot. We had no idea what type of technology and how we would be able to meet those goals, but we decided to put a yard in the ground and to rally the energy that there was and the ecosystem behind it. And the results are there. Earlier this year, we were able to announce the ordering of eight large ocean-going long-haul container vessels that will run on e-methanol. These will be the first carbon-neutral ocean-going vessels. They will pave the way for the decarbonization of the supply chain. They will form the backbone of what will constitute the rest and the future orders that we will make to renew our fleet. I hope that with these few examples, I can quickly touch upon how an old industry is actually rapidly changing, how it is adopting new technologies, new mindset, seeing a lot of investments and new players coming in in order to solve the many problems that we'll still have. Having been 25 years working on the global supply chain, I can tell you that there has never been a better moment to work in this world. The opportunities is fantastic. The momentum is really gaining pace. It has been boosted tremendously through the pandemic and something, a powerful shift is happening both amongst customers and service providers. With this, there is a lot of reasons to be optimistic that we can address these legacy issues, that we can digitize, that we can integrate, and that we can decarbonize the global supply chain, that we can make this piece of infrastructure on which our world relies so much to be a sustainable, scalable, and future-proof one. And therefore, thanks to all the work that we have done, I have not only confidence in the long-term future, but I have also confidence that this year, despite the disruption, there will be Christmas tr uh, gifts under the tree, and there will be food on the table so that we can have a nice meal with our loved ones after a bumpy year. With that, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention.